welcome to ILTV's Evening Update. I'm Aaron Porras, here with the latest news from Israel. Today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that his government is working closely with the United States to craft mutually agreed-upon settlement policies. We are in the midst of a dialogue with the White House, and our intent is to reach an agreed-upon policy regarding settlement construction, policy that is acceptable to us and not just to the Americans, Netanyahu said. An Israeli official who's been involved in the Israeli-American dialogue told the Israeli daily Haaretz that the Trump administration had proposed an understanding similar to the one that had been reached between President George W. Bush and Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. Under those guidelines, settlement construction would be restricted to built-up areas within the West Bank and would prohibit settlement expansion. However, the Prime Minister did say that he would honor his commitment to the residents of the now-demolished Amona settlement to build a new Jewish residential area in the West Bank. The Prime Minister is slated to meet with United States Special Envoy Jason Greenblatt for the second round of talks later today. Yesterday, Greenblatt met with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas for 90 minutes. Abbas was quoted as saying that Greenblatt did not propose any ideas or carry any offers. Rather, he came just to listen to what's on our minds in order to later inform President Trump. Today, Kulanu Party leader Finance Minister Moshe Kahlon announced that he and Prime Minister Netanyahu were no longer in item. Kahlon's party is a central component to the Prime Minister's ruling coalition, giving them 10 seats in the Knesset. If Kahlon's party were to leave the coalition, it would potentially force an early election, assuming that Netanyahu is unable to form a new coalition. Cajon's comments come after a spat with Netanyahu over the future of the ailing Israeli broadcast authority. Netanyahu's party has fought to disband the IBA, whereas Cajon wants to create a new state broadcaster with reduced governmental interference. Jordan is refusing to extradite convicted terrorist Alam Aref Ahmad Al-Tamimi for her role in the 2001 Sabaro suicide attack that killed 15 people, including two American citizens. In 2003, Al-Tamimi pled guilty in an Israeli court to multiple counts of murder and was sentenced to life in prison. In 2011, Al-Tamimi was released, along with 1,027 other Palestinian prisoners, as part of a deal with Hamas for captive IDF soldier Gilad Shalit. According to the United States affidavit, Al-Tamimi traveled with the suicide bomber to Jerusalem, led him into a crowded area, and taught him how to detonate the bomb. United States Attorney Channing Phillips from the District of Columbia was quoted as saying that we will continue to remain vigilant until Al-Tamimi is brought to justice. The FBI has said that it has since placed Al-Tamimi on its most wanted terrorist list. Unfortunately, Jordanian law forbids the extradition of its nationals. It looks like Bolivia has their very own Oscar Schindler, according to some recent files that have just been released. German-Jewish entrepreneur Mauricio Hochschild owned a mining company in Bolivia, and while he used to be vilified as a ruthless tycoon, old documents now show that he helped thousands of Jews flee from persecution in the 1930s. The files show that Hochschild actually drew up work contracts for Jews from Europe so that they could escape to Bolivia. The business owner brought around 9,000 Jews to Bolivia by 1939, which is actually several times more than the German industrialist Oskar Schindler is estimated to have saved from deportation to death camps. You can actually see the work that Schindler did in Steven Spielberg's Oscar-winning film from 1993 called Schindler's List. But a movie hasn't yet been made about Mauricia Hochschild. Now, the historian Robert Brockman is writing a book about the hero to show how he persuaded Bolivia's military president to open up the country to Jewish migrants. At the time, Hochschild said the measure would help develop the nation's agricultural development by bringing more laborers, but in the end, doing so helped save the lives of thousands of fugitive poets, writers, and historians. Hochschild passed away in Paris in 1965, an entire four decades before his story even ever came to light. We all want to believe that the air we are breathing is as clean as it could be, but that's not always the reality, and an Israeli-created app called Breezometer is helping the world learn that. Breezometer shows how good or poor the air quality is in a specific location, and until now, it's only been available in Israel and the United States. Now, residents of nine more countries will have the chance to really understand what they're breathing in, because the app will be able to measure air quality in China, the UK, Finland, France, Mexico, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and Hong Kong. Air pollution is now the biggest environmental cause of premature deaths worldwide, according to the OECD. In fact, it even overtakes poor sanitation and lack of clean drinking water. 
Outdoor air pollution kills more than 3 million people across the world every year, and Breezometer helps fight the issue by supplying vital information necessary to raise awareness about it. The company's CEO, Rand Korber, says their data analytics determine the dispersion and flow of air pollution in real time by gathering info from thousands of sensors around the world. Interesting enough, the app was actually created to help figure out what the safest places to visit in the world are for Korber's pregnant wife, since high pollution levels can cause physical and mental damage in fetuses and infants. Now, nine more nations will be able to help stem the issue by using Breezometer to track the quality of their own air. That's all for now. Stay tuned on ILTV.TV for our main daily broadcast playing after this. I'm Aaron Porras and see you next time with our morning briefing from Israel at 8 a.m. Eastern Time.